When we think about DevOps, we commonly think about stuff like infrastructure as code, treating servers as cattle, not pets, and making sure that all of our code goes through our CI CD pipelines with automated deployments. It's all cool stuff, right? So when we think back to why we do this, it all comes back to the same reason, automating tasks to eliminate human error. We know that human error is the biggest contributor to bugs, incidents, outages, and misconfigurations. And yet in AWS, almost every company I've worked with uses humans to manage the access that other humans have. That's an anti-pattern and I'm gonna show you how to fix it. Hey, what's up? I'm Will Button, and this is DevOps for Developers, where I talk about automation, infrastructure, code, and you guessed it, DevOps. So let me show you my AWS account here. I've got some users here who have access to my AWS account, and each user has different permissions or levels of access. And to change it, I can just point and click my way to happiness, and that's fine, because the only people who have the permissions to make changes here are people that I trust. And that's probably the same for your company as well. But we're talking about the highest levels of access available to our company. And if I change someone's permissions here, not only is there no audit trail of who changed them, why they were changed, or what they were previously, there's no way to look at someone's existing permissions and verify if that's the right level of access for that user. Let me show you a better way of how to manage this. So everything starts with filing a new issue in a GitHub repo. This particular repo is where I manage all the users, groups, and accounts for all of my different backend third-party systems. And just for a little backstory here, I'm using AWS Control Tower, which is going to be a little bit different than if you're using just regular AWS IAM, but it all you can do the same thing with either one. But Meanwhile, back into our GitHub issue here, we've got issue number three, create a user account for Johnny Testalot, and it tells us we need to create the user, grant power user permissions to the Sandbox account, and read only access to the Recognikovson account, which is my legacy AWS account that I've had for well over a decade. And I'm in the process of just making that go away because there's a bunch of stuff in there. But that's... That's beside the point. So we're gonna jump over to our code repo here where we are managing the code. We're gonna start by adding a new file and this file is gonna be our user account. So it's gonna be jtestalot.user.tf. So I'm using the .user notation to show that this is a user account versus an AWS account. And then .tf of course defines it as a Terraform file. Inside of here, I need to define a Terraform resource. The resource type is gonna be AWS Identity Store User, and we're gonna call the name of that resource the same as our username, which will be jtestalot. And then inside of here, I need to specify an Identity Store ID, and that's gonna be local.management, nope, not Identity Center, management. And I'm getting that from my main Terraform file here. I've just defined some local variables because I use them all over the place. So it was just easier to store them as variables here rather than typing out all of this stuff 6,000 different places. Makes sense, right? Hope so. Moving on, we need to define our display name for this user and that is gonna be Johnny Testalot. And then the username is going to be equal to Johnny's email address, which is Johnny Testalot or jtestalot at willbutton.com. And then uh, let's see, we need to give a name value here. Given name is equal to Johnny, and family name is equal to testalot. And then we need to specify an email. Actually, that's plural. And it is our primary email, so we need to set it equal to true, spelled correctly. And then the value is gonna be jtestalot 
dot at willbutton.com. So some of this is just to fill out the UI. So when you're looking at it in AWS, it kind of makes reasonable sense. You'll see it when we're all done here where all of this gets applied. But um, okay, so that's creating our user account and we need to assign the permissions that were specified in the ticket, meaning giving him access to the different AWS accounts that I have under management here. So it's tempting to just go right down here and start assigning those permissions, but I'm gonna try to persuade you to not to do that because what's happened in my experience is you do this because, oh, we just need to do it for this one person, but then someone else comes along who needs that, and then someone else comes along, and it cascades out of control where a year from now, you're managing individual permissions for 500 different people. So instead, we're just gonna create a group assign the permissions to those group, to that group, and then make Johnny a member of that group so that as this team expands, we just add people to the group and they inherit their permissions from the group. So that means we need a group. Maybe I can work the word group into the sentence one more time. Oh, actually, we don't need a new file because I already have AWS groups defined here. And so we'll just go right down to the bottom. I usually don't have a bunch of groups, so I just keep all my AWS groups in a single file. This is going to be an AWS identity store group. Did I spell that right? I did spell it right. And Johnny's part of our QA team, so we're just going to call the group QA. We need to specify our identity store ID. That's going to be local.management. And then the display name for our group going to be QA and the description will be members of the QA team. All right, so there's our group. And now with our group added, we can go back over to Johnny's account and add him to that group. So to do that, we'll specify another resource that resource is going to be an AWS identity store group underscore membership. And then the way I name this is going to be username underscore group membership. So it'll be J test a lot underscore QA. We need to specify the identity store ID. And that's going to be I think that's going to be our local dot management again. We'll find out, won't we? Our group ID is going to be equal to our identity store group QA dot group underscore ID. So what that's doing is whenever Terraform runs, it's going to go get the value from this group ID dynamically. So we're not having to, we could type the group ID in here manually as a string, but if that ever changes, then all of the stuff dependent on that would break. So we're just gonna give Terraform the resource locator to where it can find the group ID on its own. The next thing is specifying our member ID, and that's gonna be our identity store user user underscore ID. So if we look at what we did here, we defined a group membership resource in Terraform, and then we said, put this member in this group. All right, so the next stage here is to define the permissions for our group on the AWS accounts, right? So first thing we need to do is go to our sandbox account and we're gonna add a new resource here. This is gonna be an account assignment. And the way I name these is the AWS account, which is sandbox, and then the group or user that the permissions get applied to. In this case, it's our QA group. Scroll that up so you can see it. And so we'll do local.identitycenter here for our instance ARN. Our permission set is gonna be, uh, we can actually go check our ticket here. For the sandbox account, they get power user permissions. So we'll get our power user permission set, and we want the ARN from that. Our principal ID is our group, Q 
QA and we need the group ID from that. The principal type, that is just a string that says group. And then we need our target ID and optionally target type, but we're gonna put it in there because I think it's better to be explicit rather than not explicit. The target ID and target type is the same for all permissions assigned to this sandbox account. So we can just copy and paste that from above. So what we've done there is we've done an account assignment assigning power user access to our group QA in the AWS account ending in 7476. The last thing we need to do is give read only permissions to my legacy account. That's gonna be the same thing here, an account assignment and <clears throat> we'll give it the account name and then our group name, which is QA. Our instance ARN is our local identity center. Our permission set, we said we wanted to give read only access to this. Our principal ID is a group named QA and we associate that with the group ID. Principal type again is a group. And then this is a different AWS account. So we're gonna do the same thing, copy and paste but um, we're copying and pasting different values. All right, so that takes care of that. I'm on my main branch here, so before I commit anything, I need to switch to a new branch. I'm gonna give this branch the name three slash add Johnny test a lot. And just so you see that I'm not making that up, my GitHub issue number is three. That's why I started it with three. Sometimes there's multiple commit or multiple pull requests to close a ticket. So I do the issue number slash and then what this specific pull request is for. So we'll click create there, jump over to our commit window here. And we've got unversion files. We added our new file JTest a lot. So we'll add that. And then we updated our groups file and we updated the permissions in our two AWS accounts. So we wanna commit all of those. And then in our message here, create new QA group and add Johnny test a lot. And then we'll do the old commit and push. And it's throwing an error here saying there's nine errors there. The errors that it's bitching about is the group ID here. For whatever reason, Terraform's not picking that up as a valid attribute, but I know it is. So we're gonna commit anyway and push. So now if we switch back over to our repo here, you can see that we've got recent pushes so we can open up our pull request. It populated that for me. And then I'm gonna say, closes number three, and you can see it auto completes that to issue number three. And then we'll elaborate here a little bit, um, add user Johnny test a lot, create group QA, add read only permissions to Rick and Nickerson, and power user permissions to sandbox. So we've got our commits down here. That shouldn't be anything surprising here. That's what we typed in. So we'll go ahead and create our pull request. And now this is gonna kick off some stuff for us here. So right now merging's blocked. We've got some checks that haven't completed yet because right now Terraform Cloud is running a test on this to see that it can actually complete this. We also have a review required here, so that's where I need to get someone else from my team to review my changes. And that's one of the cool things about this, right, is doing it this way means that we can agree on how things should get implemented. I talked about creating a group and applying permissions to the group versus applying permissions to the user specifically. This is where that peer review comes into play, right? Had I added the permissions to our new user account directly, 
when this goes through peer review, hopefully whoever is peer reviewing this would see that and say, hey, that's not how we do it here. We actually assign our permissions to groups and then add users to groups. So I'd like for you to go and change that. And that's the purpose of the peer review process. Um, meanwhile, back at our test, all of our checks have passed. We hit show checks. That's just our Terraform cloud running. And then I'm gonna do this because it's just you and I here and you can't actually review this for me. Uh, so I'm gonna use my administrative permissions to go ahead and merge this. And we're done with that branch so we can delete that. And now check this out. Because I put closes number three in here, when I go back over to our issues, that has automatically been closed for me. Now, whenever I go over to uh, Terraform, you can see that that has triggered my Terraform cloud to run based on the pull request. It's planning that. We can go check out the details. And so it's going to create the identity store group membership for Johnny Testalot in the QA group. It's creating our group QA. It's creating our user Johnny Testalot, creating the account assignment for our legacy account in QA, the sandbox account assignment, and then that's just our synchronization. Um, so basically this is saying, here's what I'm gonna do. Is that cool with you? I'm gonna click confirm and apply, and then confirm, and that's gonna go off and trigger that run. And that completed successfully. So now, if we go back over here to my IAM Identity Center, refresh that, check that out. We've got a new user called Johnny Testalot. Here's where his first name and last name and display name all came into play. Um, his email address is in here. Yeah, primary email is right there. And then groups, it shows that he is a member of the QA group. If we go look at the QA group, here that is. He's the only member. And then we can actually go one step further and take a look at our AWS accounts. And in Sandbox, I've got the Sandbox account. So when I click on that, we've got a QA user group with power user access. And we can actually go check the legacy account, which is this guy. There's our QA user with the read-only permission set. This gives us the ability to prove our level of access during audits. We have a plan, we can show how we follow the plan, and we have a way to detect when the plan hasn't been followed, all of which are key steps to passing any audit, whether that's PCI, HIPAA, SOX, or any other regulatory compliance. It also makes it easy to secure accounts when people move on to other roles or other careers because all of their access is documented in one file. Finally, since we're using a tool like Terraform, we can extend this to manage accounts and permissions for any service that Terraform can talk to, not just AWS. I hope this has inspired you to rethink about how you're handling user accounts and permissions. Let me know your thoughts in the comments. Subscribe to the channel so you don't miss future videos and be sure to check out the DevOps roadmap in the description to learn how this ties in with all the other facets of software engineering to build better, more scalable software. <laughs>